Suppose we have a smooth, closed planar curve, that is, a 2D curve with no edges and no sharp bumps. We're going to define a few points of interest on such a curve, and then state a rather remarkable fact that relates them to one another. The first is the number of times the curve crosses itself, which we'll call d for double points. The next is the number of inflection points for the curve, which we'll call i. An inflection point is a point where the signed curvature of the curve changes sign, or less precisely, it's where the curve stops bending in one direction and starts bending in a different direction. And the last variable, or variables, is what's called a bitangent. This is a line that's tangent to the curve at exactly two points, as I've shown here. We'll also classify our bitangents based on the way that they touch the curve. The one I've drawn here touches the curve two times on the same side of the line, and in this case we'll call it a positive bitangent, or t+. Plus. We could also draw a bitangent where the points of tangency touch on opposite sides of the curve, and in this case, you guessed it, we'll say that this is a negative bitangent, or t-. minus. Here's what the curve looks like with all the bitangents drawn in. With these terms defined, we can get to the main event of the video, the fabricius biere theorem, which says t plus minus t minus minus d minus i over 2 equals 0. And it's always 0, for all smooth closed planar curves, no matter how you smush or flip or transform your curve. And come on, if this fact isn't at least a little surprising to you, then you have no heart. To me, it doesn't even seem like bitangents, double points, and inflection points carry enough information to be related to one another without some other variable tossed in there. And perhaps some of the simpler drawings I've shown here makes you think I've gotten lucky, so take this more complicated scribbly shape here. Now brace yourself, there's about to be a lot of tangents on the screen. Whoa. And even still, if you squint and count carefully, the relationship still holds. Even more incredible is we don't even need any calculus or trigonometry to prove this theorem. All we need is some spatial reasoning and a little bit of algebra. And personally, I find the proof to be equal parts as interesting to the theorem itself, so let's get into it. What we're going to do to prove the theorem is define a function that takes some point on the edge of the curve, which we'll creatively call x, and then we'll draw an infinite ray that's tangent to the curve at x. The direction of the ray doesn't matter so long as we're consistent for any point that we pick on the curve. Then the output of our function, which we'll call fc, is simply the number of times this ray crosses our curve. So at the top here, the function has a value of 0, down here it has a value of 2 since it crosses twice, etc. And merely by studying the behavior and properties of this crossing function, we will be able to prove the fabricius biere theorem. Before we continue with the proof, I need to give a technicality. The fabricius biere theorem is only true for simple smooth curves, which adds some subtle but important assumptions. The first is that all our double points are just double points, meaning the curve doesn't pass through itself three or more times at the same point. Also, all our bitangents need to be tangent at exactly two places. So this example doesn't work because the tangent points touch the line at the same place. Similarly, we can't have the tangent points touch the same place on the same side of the line. And also, when I say exactly two places, that means we can't have any multi-tangent lines, which are tangent to three or more places. We also can't have a bitangent pass through an inflection point, because then it wouldn't be a positive bitangent or a negative bitangent. And lastly, all the quantities need to be finite, which basically amounts to not having any perfectly straight sections in our curve. If this feels oddly restrictive, think about how finely constructed a curve would need to be to fit any of these criteria. We might say that for some general smooth curve, we wouldn't expect to find any of these extremes in the first place. This is similar to how if you're proving something about three random dots in space, you may say to assume that they're in a general arrangement, to avoid the edge case of the dots being collinear, since a random arrangement is almost certainly not going to have all three dots in a line. This may all seem pedantic, but the following proof does not work unless you make these assumptions. The challenge for you is to figure out what parts of the proof break down when we don't make these assumptions. Alright, back to our crossing function. Naturally, the first thing we may want to do with this strange function is make a graph of the output to get a feel for its behavior. But how do we go about graphing such a function? To get a graph, we'll need some way of mapping the real number line to our curve so we'd know where to graph the output of x, what's in math called a parametrization for the curve. In some areas of math, the way you define a parametrization is strict, but for our proof we simply need a continuous one, 
That is, you can take some section of the number line and stretch and bend it, but not cut it, such that it looks like your curve. In my examples, I'll parametrize the curve using 0 to 1, but the argument stays the same regardless of how you do it, so long as it's continuous. With a parametrization, we can simply change the value of x from 0 to 1 and trace the output of the function as we do so to get our graph. What we get is this odd-looking step function. This makes sense though because the crossing function outputs the number of crossing points of this ray, which is always a whole number, and these jumps correspond to changes in that whole number value. Also, notice how the behavior of the function is periodic. That is, if we make one loop around the curve, we always end with the same number we started with. This means that the sum total of all the jumps in the curve has to equal zero. This is the main key insight we'll use to build an equation later, so remember that. Now it's clear that if we want to understand this function better, we need to know what causes these jumps. Let's focus on the ray. We can clearly see that gaining or losing points along the edge of the ray has to come in pairs. Why? Well, if we were to only pick up or lose a single point, then that means our ray came into contact with an end point on the curve, which can't happen because we're working with a closed curve. We could definitely pick up or lose exactly two crossing points though, which corresponds to the edge of the ray crossing a tangent point. Since the ray itself is also tangent to the curve, then we conclude that our bitangents are one source of jumps for Fc. But what about the vertex of the ray? We can certainly lose a single crossing point as our point x moves across a double point on the curve. And we also lose a crossing point when we pass over an inflection point, since it's kind of like passing a bitangent and a double point at the same time. Now we know the only times fc changes value is when we pass a bitangent, a double point, or an inflection point. It's worth convincing yourself that this is true and reasoning through it on your own, since we haven't actually proved this fact, we're more relying on intuition and spatial reasoning here. This conclusion seems promising though, because these are exactly the points of interest that we're after in the fabricius beer theorem. Now that we know what makes the crossing functions have these jumps, we now want to find out how much they make a jump. Let's start by taking a look at double points. Like we said earlier, we lose a crossing whenever we pass a double point. And notice that for every single double point, this happens twice on a whole trip around the curve. So we're going to give double points a score of minus 2, since that's the effect it has on the total sum of jumps for Fc. Inflection points similarly reduce our count by 1, but we only pass them once, so these get a score of minus 1. Bitangents are different because the effect on Fc changes based on their orientation. In this setup, Fc jumps a total of 2. That's 2 for the left half and 0 for the right half. But in this setup, Fc jumps a total of 4. That's 2 for each side. We'll call the first orientation where the arrows move in the same direction a type A positive bitangent, which we said has a score of 2. When the arrows point towards each other, we'll call this a type B positive bitangent, which we said has a score of 4. And the last scenario, and you guessed it, we'll call it type C, is when our paths point away from each other, and in this case the total jumps is 0. Now we're going to need to expand our table a bit to make room for the new types, and we're going to play the same game with negative bitangents too. Notice this time that a type A negative bitangent has the effect of decreasing the crossing number by 2, so instead its score is minus 2. Type B negative bitangents get a crossing score of minus 4. And type C negative bitangents get a crossing score of 0. It may seem a bit concerning that we're classifying bitangents into three different types, whereas our target equation doesn't do this at all. What I'll leave you with is that the total number of bitangents, that is, either t plus or t minus, is the sum of all the type A, type B, and type C bitangents. You know, since any bitangent has to be one of those types. This is a fact we'll use at the end to clean up the types. Now that we have a table that describes how Fc behaves, recall the fact that Fc is periodic so the sum of all the jumps has to equal zero. This means that we can assemble all the values in the table into an equation and set it equal to zero. 
All right, hang in there now, we're really close. This is not quite the equation we're after, and this is where we can pull a trick. Earlier I said we can pick a direction of the ray to define the crossing function, and we just need to be consistent, remember? Now what we'll do is pick the opposite direction and get an entirely new equation. It's similar, after all, it's related to the same curve, but it is different. What this is going to do is let us play the same game where we tabulate the ways fc jumps, and it turns out we get slightly different numbers. The argument for double points and inflection points doesn't change, so their score going backwards is the same. I'll leave it to you to puzzle through why this is, but notice what happens to our positive bite tangents now that we've reversed directions. Here are the different types once again, and when we flip this in the opposite direction, type A still has a score of 2, but type B positive bi tangents and type C positive bi tangents have turned into one another. So moving in reverse, type B positive bi tangents have a score of 0, and type C positive bi tangents have a score of 4. And notice how we see the exact same thing with our negative bi tangents. Now we have two scores for each row in our table one for forwards and one for backwards. This means we get to make two equations, and everything from here is just algebra autopilot. Since we have two valid equations, algebra says we can add them together, so we'll do that. Now we see that we have a 4 that we can nicely factor out, and now we see that the different types of bitangents have the same coefficients, which means we can use those equations from earlier to swap the three types out for their typeless counterparts. If we also divide both sides by 4, we now have the equation we're after, completing the proof. Isn't that lovely? Surely a proof you'll never forget. That certainly was the case for me at least. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching all the way through. I've never made something like this before, so please do let me know what you thought of this in the comments. I want to give a special thanks to those in the Manum community for helping me learn how to make the animations for this video, and also to Grant for organizing the Summer of Math exposition. Without those things, this video would have never happened. I'll leave some wrap-up details in the description of the video for those who want to learn more, and I'll see you in the next one.